I want you for a moment to imagine the scene of the Prophet ﷺ's death. When you had Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, and these type of people there, and the people were in such trauma that there was a Bedouin Arab who was running around back and forth in the masjid saying, Allahumma khuth basari, oh Allah, take away my eyesight because I don't want to lay my eyes on anyone after the Prophet ﷺ. And you know, subhanAllah, the death of the Prophet ﷺ being the greatest tragedy that this ummah has ever faced, was, it was so great that after the Prophet ﷺ passed away for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, the way to console a person who had lost someone beloved to them was to say to that person, Uthkur Musabaka fi Mauti Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Remember the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Remember the tragedy, your disaster, your tragedy and the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But in essence, Al Imam al Dhahabi rahimahullah, he said something extremely powerful. He said, Wallahi, even though he passed away sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was still alive in the actions and in the character of the people. You could look at people and you could find the exact demonstration of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. They were trying to smile like him ﷺ. They were trying to act like him. They were trying to walk like him ﷺ. He was alive in the ummah until eventually people moved on to other things. And you know, subhanAllah, this talk would be different from any other talk that I've ever given because I'm not going to do uh, what our beloved Sheikh did and mention many sources and mention different stories and different tafsirs and things of that sort. Because many times we look at the lives of these great men, the Sahaba of the Prophet ﷺ, we look at the Prophet ﷺ and there's this idea that we can't be them so we might as well not try to aspire. But there are people that have lived amongst us that tried to follow their example and that succeeded in becoming tremendous people because the Prophet ﷺ said, Fi kulli qarnin min ummati sabiqoon. Shaykh Yasir talked earlier about Al Mujaddid, the one person at the head of every 100 years, but also in an authentic riwayah in Abu Nu'aym. In every single generation, of my Muslims, of my nation, there are people that are foremost that are sabiqoon. And today I wanted to talk about the person that I met, the person that I knew that inspired me more than any other human being ever has. I have a person that was not a sheikh, that was not a scholar. In fact, if you were to ask this person what madhab she followed, if you were to ask this person uh, about some of the terms that we see floating around on Facebook today, she would not even know what they were. She's the most inspirational human being that I've ever met. And it's my mother, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on her. Because many times we look for role models, we look for heroes, and we try to find them in books or we try to find them you know, as great scholars that live halfway across the world that we would never meet, but we neglect the role models and the heroes that are in our homes. How many of us would not even be here if our parents did not teach us La ilaha illallah? Yes, Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides people to Islam. But at the same time, how many of us are here because our parents cared enough about us to teach us the meaning of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah? So I wanted to share with you, my dear brothers and sisters, for the purpose that you of you making dua for her and understanding that wallahi there are pe there are people that live and lived amongst us that are truly extraordinary and amazing people and i just wanted to talk about her upbringing for a moment my my mother rahimahullah ta'ala was the granddaughter of al allama munib hassan rahimahullah the faqih of palestine in the ottoman empire the only Arab scholar in Mahkamah the, Tamiz, the, the court of high scholars in the time of the in, the, in the later part, period of the Ottoman Empire. If you're thinking to yourself, I'm saying that just so everyone can say, Masha Allah, that's why she's such a great person. Her grandfather was the Faqih of Palestine. You're wrong. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested her family and the people, the children, some of the children of Munib Hashim rahimahullah ta'ala actually left Islam in Palestine. They were part of the royal families. 
my mother was the first cousin of the mother of Queen Alia of Jordan. And they were from Bani Hashim, Banu Hashim, the direct descendants of the Prophet Sallallahu And I know that it, that doesn't impress you if you're Desi because every Desi thinks that they're from the lineage of the Prophet Sallallahu I know all of you are Sayyids, all that kind of stuff. It doesn't impress me either. But with all of that, her family were not a people who used to pray, they used to drink. My mother grew up in a totally Catholic school in Jerusalem next to the Church of Nativity run by nuns. And when she grew up in that school, she did not understand what it was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted her to be. The granddaughter of the Faqih of Palestine. She didn't know. She grew up confused. But at the same time, she always had this inclination to spirituality. So although her family was extremely religious and upright, she used to sneak out of her house as a seven, eight, nine-year-old girl and go pray Salat al-Fajr in the masjid. Just asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for some form of guidance, even as a young baby, even as a child, as a toddler. She had inclinations. Her fitra was always calling out. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed her after she finished her schooling, not to take the path of becoming a nun or anything of that sort. She graduated with a degree in Arabic literature. She became a teacher. She was caring, compassionate. She loved to teach. So she taught in Ramallah. She taught in Palestine. And then whenever she came to America, the irony of it was is that she taught some of the daughters of her students in Palestine. Loved to teach Arabic. Loved to be compassionate, kind towards her students. Loved to raise people. Loved to see other people smile, was always smiling. And subhanAllah, we look at the khuluq of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and one of the descriptions of him sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Kana basaman dahakan alayhi salatu wasalam. He was always smiling and laughing and making other people smile or laugh. I cannot recall a single picture of my mother as a child with her not smiling. And I remember all of the moments where she would smile at every single person that she would see. And it was that khuluq, that character that won people's hearts. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not send her true guidance until she met my father, not in Palestine, but in Houston, in the University of Houston. And at that time, they got married at the Islamic Center on Richmond Avenue, the only masjid that was in Houston, which was just a house. And she didn't understand where her life was going. But at the same time, she trusted Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enough that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would guide her to the straight path. She started wearing hijab later on in her life. She started to draw close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She started to pray. And then in the 1980s, 1981 to be exact, she developed a disease called mysthemia gravis, which is Latin for grave muscle disorder. She lost her ability to walk freely. She started feeling like her muscles were weak. She wasn't as mobile as other people. Then she developed another blood disorder. She had to go through 17 blood transfusions in two years. After my brother, my older brother Jamal was born, whenever she sat with the doctor, the doctor told her that she would never be able to have kids again. And wallahi, their brothers and sisters, this woman who had just started practicing Islam just a few years, she laughed at the doctor and she said, you're not God. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed her to get pregnant a month later and she was pregnant with me. And whenever she became pregnant with me, the doctors told her that you're not going to survive and your, or your baby's not going to survive because all of the blood transfusions at that time there was the AIDS scare all of these diseases that probably came in with this blood it's not going to happen Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala proved them wrong once again with her faith in Allah azza wa jal that was no obstacle to her she never doubted for a moment she never said why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doing this to me in 1990 she had her first stroke and it was discovered that it was because she had throat cancer. She came out of that stroke and she said, Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through this stroke has purified me from the sins that I had before. Then a few years later, 
another stroke, 1993. And they discovered that the cancer was getting more severe. She had to go through chemotherapy. The doctor said the chance of her survival is 40% or less. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala proved them wrong. She never complained. She said, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wallahi, not once complaining. Not once saying, why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doing this to me? I just started wearing hijab. I just started praying. And her family members actually told her that this is God punishing you because you wear hijab. And she said, no, you're wrong. This is Allah purifying me from my past. She kept going. In 1996, she had another stroke, a third stroke. And with this stroke, she went into an unresponsive coma for 14 days. The doctors told us she has no chance whatsoever. She's just a vegetable. She's not going to wake up from this. While the doctor was speaking to my father on the 14th day and telling him she has no chance, she opened her eye and she said, Ahmed, I'm thirsty. My dad's name, Ahmed. Get me a cup of water. And she drank from that water. She said, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is purifying me. Can you imagine with all of that? Half of my childhood, she was in the hospital. She once had a detached retina. We were walking on, in the mall and her retina fell out and she couldn't see anymore. She had to have thyroid, her thyroid taken out. She had osteoporosis. All I remember is my mother going to the hospital time and time and time again. And while she would go, she would make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She would say, oh Allah, purify my sins and allow me to see my children grow. All she wanted was to see her children grow up. And every single time she was in the hospital, she would make that dua. And the interesting thing about her is that when people would visit her in the hospital, she would make it a point to host them. She could barely move, but she would still make it a point to host them. With the 1996 stroke, she lost most of her memory. She forgot our names. She forgot Surah Al-Fatiha. And in one year after 1996, within one year, she memorized four juz of the Quran back. Now she's not a Sahabi and someone's going to say, well, four juz, that's not much. For a woman who barely has memory, to be able to sit there and pound four juz into her head over an entire year was something that, subhanAllah, I don't think many of us could have achieved. After that, she lost her speech. And she could barely talk. And when she would talk, it was hard to understand her, but she would still try. And the only people that could understand her were the people that were always around her. She would have to repeat herself two, three, four times, and she also had bad hearing. All she would say was tasbih and tahleel. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm telling you to the point that, wallahi, when I think of my mother, rahimahullah ta'ala, I don't even remember her, or actually I remember her without hijab, but when I have images of her, I remember her walking around in her hijab. She used to sit there during her cooking and read tafsir the entire day, memorize the Quran the entire day. And she used to say, Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved me from hearing the type of things that people talk about in gatherings and saved me from speaking because I might backbite with that. Alhamdulillah, no one understands me except for Allah. She used to say that to us when she was angry. No one understands me except for Allah. But she said, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, because that stops me from getting the sins of backbiting. Continued forth with her life. And she was so, subhanAllah, so passionate that even though she wasn't able to speak, she used to write poetry about Palestine, poetry about Bosnia. She used to put her words on paper. And I found one of her old poems, one of the most beautiful poems. She wrote about the rock, the stone in Palestine. She said, Hayya man yahmiluni inni tha'ir fi sadri tahya al-dama'ir asrar al-atfali wal-ajaiz israr shabin lam yajid ghayri yuqatil zalamuni hina qalu la uqatil zalamuni hina qalu hajarun samit fa ana ashur wa uhis wa anbud wa unadil barak allahu fil hajar al-majid wa barak allahu fil tifl al-sharid fa ana min ardi falastin nabatu wa fi kul al-ardi zuri'tu wa li kalimati allahu akbar sajadtu 
That was from her poetry, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, where she wrote, Who will carry me? Meaning the stone, I am a rebel. Inside of my chest, my conscience is alive, the secrets of the young and the old. The determination of a people that was unable to find other than me to fight for them. Their saying that I'm unable to fight wronged me. They wronged me when they said that I was a silent stone. I feel, I hurt, I beat and I struggle. May Allah bless the living stone. May Allah bless the homeless child. For I was planted in the land of Palestine, but I was grown in every land. And for the greatness of Allah, I fell in sujood. I remember her, dear brothers and sisters, and all of I think of was that anything that happened to her, she always said, Alhamdulillah. When there was any gathering, she would always be the person to look for the one sitting in the corner to take them out. If there was someone that was unknown to try to talk to them and laugh with them, even though she could barely talk. And I remember that even as a young boy, she used to actually come and apologize. And this is probably bad parenting, but you know what? It shows you that heart of gold, subhanAllah. She used to come to us and apologize whenever she would yell at us. She would wake us up at 2, 3 a.m. to say, I'm sorry, do you forgive me? We were children. And it was kind of like, Mom, I'm trying to sleep, you know. <laughs> SubhanAllah, do you forgive me? And then I remember on one night, and this was August 30th of 2007, she walked into my room at 2 a.m. She sat me down. And she said, I just wanted to let you know, I'm pleased with you. And that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes me away for some reason, I want you to continue and go ahead with your wedding, which was just in a few months. My nikah was right before that. And subhanAllah, she started to give me her wasiyah. I said, mom, what are you talking about? Can you stop? I don't want to hear all of this. She started to give me her wasiyah because she knew the next day I was going to a youth camp in the masjid and I wasn't going to be home for three days. Nothing was wrong with her. She was fine. And subhanAllah, Ramadan was right around the corner and my mother was a pro at Ramadan. My father-in-law, Sheikh Hussam Mubarak, Sheikh Abul Abid, Hafilahullah, he used to make a challenge. He used to say, let's have a competition. Let's see who can read the Qur'an the most times in Ramadan. And I remember that previous Ramadan, a woman who could barely read and probably didn't have the best tajweed in the world, who only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could understand. And she finished reading the Qur'an 14 times in Ramadan. It was her life. It was everything about her. And my father told me that subhanAllah, those three days of her life were the happiest days of her life. She was just smiling uncontrollably laughing uncontrollably, saying Alhamdulillah uncontrollably, and nobody understood why. Until Monday morning, when I was on my way to pick her up, she had another stroke in the closet. And this time she wouldn't get back up. And SubhanAllah, I remember that week being the most unreal week of my life. I remember at the janazah thinking to myself, how was it when the Prophet ﷺ was buried? How is it that someone that's so amazing in your eyes, and she died on Laylatul Jum'ah, the night of Friday, Alhamdulillah, another blessing upon her, and her janazah was after Salatul Jum'ah. And I remembered, how was it that they buried the Prophet ﷺ? And I remember that, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, she didn't have a single enemy in the world. Wallahi ya akhwani wa akhawati, she did not know much. She didn't have much knowledge, but it was her character. It was her character. And if you're wondering how I could put myself through that, I remember when I was sitting there and I was watching her being buried, and I think anyone who lost their parent understands. And I remembered Fatima radiallahu anha asking Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, how did you put dirt on the face of my father sallallahu alayhi wasallam? How could you bring yourself to a point where you could put dirt on the face of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam? And Anas radiallahu anhu said, Wallahi ankarna qulubuna. We denied our hearts. We pretend our hearts weren't there. We had to eliminate our hearts to be able to do that. And I think about her all the time. 
for five years now, I've waited for the moment where I could tell her life story. A woman who had a possibility of becoming a nun or just a secular person who would drink alcohol just like everybody else in her family. But instead she drew close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and she never complained and she understood that whatever came to her was a means of elevation.